Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Spring 2021 Briefing from the University of Arizona. I'm Holly Jensen, Vice President of Communications for the University. Dr. Robert Robbins, President of the University of Arizona, is going to provide important updates on the university's vaccine distribution and university operations and will be followed by his dynamic duo partner, Dr. Richard Carmona, 17th Surgeon General of the United States and distinguished professor here at the university. He'll provide some updates on the current state of COVID-19 in our state, county, and on our campus. It's important to note that we are currently looking for qualified medical professionals to administer vaccines. We're also looking for some pharmacists and nursing staff to um, staff our pod here at the University of Arizona. If you are qualified and interested, we have positions posted through the talent portion of our HR website at arizona.csod.com. At the end of today's uh, briefing, I'll take your questions. Please make sure you type your name and news organization into the chat, into the panel, and I'll take them in the order they were received. Over to you, President Robbins. Thank you, Holly, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> As Holly said, I'm really looking forward to sharing some exciting and important updates today. But before that, we get to that, I wanted to thank our faculty, staff, and students for the strong beginning to the spring semester. We remain in stage two for instruction this week, and we expect the same next week, the week of March 15th. So I, I just wanna pause here and kind of go off script and recall that it was this week, one year ago, Friday, March 13th, that uh, we, we sent out the message to our students. Uh, they were preparing to go on spring break. Everybody was excited. They were a little anxious about what this whole COVID-19 thing was about, but we told them, please don't come back. We're going to go all online and, and the students, the faculty, the staff did a tremendous job in getting our students through the spring semester this week, starting this week, a year ago. Just think about what has happened in one year. Um, and it's just tremendous. The, the scientific uh, achievement of getting vaccine to the world is really, one of the great scientific stories that will be written for, for hundreds of years to come. So I just wanted to stop and reflect on that. It's been a year. Our first press briefing was April 14th, where I uh, uh, infamously said, I, I, I just don't see us having fans in the stand at our football game. And turns out, you know, we weren't even going to have a football season. Then we got into it later in a in a truncated way, but this is an important week. We've been at this for one year. And, uh, and I just want to acknowledge the incredible work that everyone at the university, many of whom are doing two and three jobs simultaneously for this last year. And, and the incredible challenge, uh, challenges and resiliency that everyone has shown. I'm, I'm incredibly appreciative and proud to be part of the University of Arizona. So from March 1 to March 6, we administered 11,242 COVID-19 tests with 29 positives, a positivity rate of 0.26. We continue to be well under 1%. And again, I just have to thank our incredible team of scientists and public health officials who have developed some novel testing strategies for our test, trace, and treat strategies. Uh, and I, I just couldn't be more proud to be part of the University of Arizona. By this afternoon, the university pod will have administered 50,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. That's truly amazing. And Chris Kopak and the hundreds of people who make this happen for our community in Southern Arizona need a big congratulations. 50,000 doses in essentially a month. We thought we would be into April or May before we hit 50,000. We have a thermometer out there and I said, you know, it'd be kind of cool that by, by May uh, we would hit 50,000. We're gonna hit 50,000 doses today. 
Its daily progress is now recorded on the COVID-19 dashboard, so you can all follow along. Along with the testing results, go to covid19.arizona.edu forward slash DAS H board for the latest. We've seen an unexpected decline in the demand for appointments with the latest batch of openings. We're now serving those aged 65 and older, as well as other 1A and prioritized 1B community members. This can get a little bit complicated, but uh, we'll help you walk through whether you're qualified or not. The goal, of course, is to get everybody vaccinated as fast as possible, but uh, the state is going through these prioritized phased approaches. Uh, and as, the, as Dr. Carmona reminds us all the time, the rate limiting factor is the supply of vaccine, which is continuing to, uh, uh, to be um, available to us. This last week, Johnson & Johnson uh, was released and I believe we in Tucson have some Johnson & Johnson vaccine just within a matter of days of it getting approved. If you are eligible and have not yet been vaccinated, please go to podvaccine.azdhs.gov to make an appointment. If you're having trouble navigating the website, just call 602-542-1000, 602 602- 542-1000, you can actually speak to a person who will help you. We have many spots open this week and almost 50,000 doses of vaccine are expected to arrive in Pima County this week, 50,000 doses. That is an incremental increase of a significant amount. I think the highest uh, back before the state pod opened was around 30,000 one week and it had been averaging about 15 to 17,000. So 50,000 doses of vaccine will be administered in Pima County this week. As we make prox progress vaccinating our population here in Southern Arizona, statewide and throughout the nation, I know everyone is eager to return to their normal routines. We all need to remain vigilant, however. This is not over by a long shot. If we do, while things may not look exactly the way they did before this time last year, we will begin to move to more and more opportunities to see the people we care about and do the things we enjoy. We're not quite ready to open it wide open yet, and it'll, it'll be a while. We just have to remain disciplined and vigilant. This includes the university spring 2021 commencement. And we know many students are eager to learn our plans. Provost Folks and I are very pleased to announce the University of Arizona will celebrate the class of 2021 with a series of in-person ceremonies tentatively scheduled from Tuesday, May 11th to Tuesday, May 18th. We're gonna have many uh, uh, different smaller venues in order to be safe. As currently envisioned, the in-person component of these ceremonies will be for students only. Discussions are ongoing and we will update plans as, as are appropriate. The ceremonies also will be streamed live and recorded so that our students' families and their friends can participate remotely. The ceremonies will combine multiple academic areas in order to abide by public health guidelines and safety recommendations. We are very excited to offer these opportunities for students to be recognized and celebrated in person. Please know that in-person participation is obviously completely optional. All eligible students will be sent an email in the coming weeks with more information, including backup plans in the event that public health conditions require a change. Regular updates will be provided at commencement.arizona.edu. As we move forward with these plans, the health of our faculty, staff, and students is our top priority. Always has been, always will be. We've been in regular contact with Pima County health officials 
throughout the planning process, and we will continue to rely on their expertise so that any events reflect local, state, and national public health guidelines. I just want to thank Dr. Cullen, Dr. Garcia, Mr. Huckleberry, Mayor Romero. We have very good working relationships with our city, county, and state partners. And we're going to work through this to bring as much in-person celebration of the class of 2021 as we can. This past year has obviously been very, very challenging. And I know that it's had a significant impact on the senior year of this graduating class. We're all looking forward to coming together in a different but memorable, uh, memorable way to celebrate the academic achievements of the class of 2021. I want to thank Heather Lucart, our Assistant Vice President for Presidential Events and University Ceremonies, and her entire team from throughout the university, students, faculty, staff, for this amazing work so far. They have looked at what other universities are doing. They've listened to what our students, their families would like to see. Uh, the ceremony team is also exploring options to celebrate the class of 2020 in a distinct way as many people have requested that. We're able to provide this opportunity for the class of 2021 due in large part to the success of the tra test, trace, and treat protocol in minimizing the spread of COVID-19 on our campus over this past academic year. Everyone has done their part. It has been a truly remarkable success. Uh, with the vaccination pod operating at a high capacity, we expect that all faculty and staff will be able to be vaccinated this spring. And we're committed to ensuring students can be vaccinated swiftly as soon as they are eligible. And I would love to see that happen before they leave for summer break. And we're working toward that as quickly as possible. We're also looking forward to the fall 2021 semester with these successes in mind. And we intend to provide an in-person learning experience for all of those students who desire to be on campus in person. We plan to return most courses at the main campus to fully in-person formats with some courses offered as flex in-person as appropriate for public health needs. Live online and iCourse options will remain available for students who need or wish to, to uh, learn, continue to learn remotely. More information will be shared with our students via email in the coming days. Registration for fall will begin in early April. Thank you again for joining us today. I'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Carmona, uh, but I, I just wanted to say a year into this, there are some exciting developments and Rich, I, I think they're moving probably about six to eight months faster than, than I uh, had predicted. I, I'm glad I was wrong on this prediction. Thanks, Bobby. And uh, good morning to all of uh, our viewers and a big thanks to uh, continuing to hang with us for this year plus that we've been at this. Uh, monumental change has occurred, uh, acceleration of science, many programs that are benefiting the public and will continue to benefit the public for, for uh, lessons learned during COVID as we move forward. So, um, I'll cover some of the data today and then and Bobby and I'll have a little discussion on some issues that are trending that, that we are working on. So uh, first slide, please. So uh, again, as you know, we always talk about the seven day rolling averages and uh, you know, we're doing pretty well now. We've gone from uh, the best to the worst and back down closest to the best again. And so uh, with uh, we're 16th nationally, if you look at New Jersey and California as comparators. California has done a lot better as well, and Pima County is doing fairly well. So overall, these numbers are trending in the right direction, but as the president said, it is no time to become complacent. We continue to need to bear down, mask up, stay socially distant, and do all of the things that we spoke about, including everybody getting vaccinated who has the ability to be vaccinated. Next slide. We look at our transmission values, the RT value. Again, exceptionally low. 
And we're very happy with that. And it's telling us that the programs we've had in place, the great advice we get from our, our public health advisory team, our, all of our doctors, clinicians, researchers, you know, we have the best information readily available. The president gets an update and a situation report every 24 hours to be able to make timely decisions. And this data tells us we're moving in the right direction. But again, we are still at an area where we're in the middle of a pandemic and not ready to uh, open the doors and continue uh, with what used to be normal activities. As the president and I continue to reemphasize, it is very, very important that we continue to adhere to these best public health practices to keep these numbers down and decrease transmissibility. Next slide. So if you look at the testing results on our dashboard there, if you want some more information, you can go a little deeper. But the president alluded to the total testing window. We, we got over 200,000 tests, almost 206,000 right now. That is just remarkable. And again, if we look at the percent positivity, which we watch, it's, it's all very low, one, two percent or so, and staying below that 5% threshold that we have announced a year ago that we were, were uh, that was our goal. So we're doing well, but we need to do even better to make sure that we can extinguish this virus from our society and prevent any further transmissibility. Next slide. And the number of tests and percent positive by day, again, you can see the dark line on the bottom as you go from left to right. Uh, our percentage of tests positive are, are dropping. The number of tests are still high. So overall, you know, we're doing very well in this area, but we are still not satisfied. I can tell you that uh, the president is up most nights and it keeps many of us awake in late night phone calls and emails and texts to make sure we always have the most recent information. And, and you know, the science is evolving. So there's not always an easy answer, but you know, the president has been very clear. We're gonna be driven by the best science, make the best decisions on the best science available to us. And that's what we've been doing. Next slide. This is of a, a the CART deployment is a concern again this week we see on the week of 3-1, you'll see that there are three incidents of 50 to 99 people. And, um, you know, that's a plus up from last week of two. Now, the significance there, these are large groups that are being very close, that often are not masked and having a good time, but they're also vectors for disease. Every one of those 50 to 99 young men or women who are out there and they go back to their homes, they go back to their families, they go back to their classes, they can be carrying disease and spreading disease. So it's most important that the students, faculty, staff work with us to adhere to these best practices. You can't be doing this. The CART team has been terrific working in concert with Tucson Police Department, the University Police Department, the Dean's Office to be able to address these issues in an academic fashion. You know, we're trying to inspire people to change their behaviors, but where necessary, you know, the Dean, Kendall Washington has taken the appropriate action and sometimes it requires disciplinary action, even expelling students at time. We don't wanna ha have to do that, but our goal is to protect our community. So please, please do not congregate in these large groups unprotected because you're spreading disease and making it much more difficult for us to keep the doors open and increase our students on campus. Next slide. So Bobby, as we, as we look at all of the great things that have happened and uh, the science just moves us forward, you know, everything from testing to the vaccinations and our, you know, extraordinary team that, we, you know, you've put together here, uh, we're still having some challenges. And, and, and the ones that I think is worth mentioning today are the discussions we've had now for quite some time about those vulnerable populations, especially people of color, people that are geographically uh, displaced, uh, living in our rural areas. Uh, and, you know, U of A has a very big, big footprint. So I'm not talking just about Pima County, who we've partnered with and continue to work with them and our rural health office, but the larger area that as far as Maricopa County, where we have responsibility and all of our adjacent communities in the South, where often they have a paucity of resources to be able to get to people in these areas. Then on top of that, you know, we're dealing with health disparities, social determinants of health. Uh, many barriers to getting people vaccinated and then vaccine hesitancy. And very often in these communities of color, the hesitancy is high and, and probably justifiable so when people read the uh, history of bad things that have happened in the past, the Tuskegee experiments and not trusting government and so on. 
And yet, if we can't get to all of those people in a timely fashion, we prolong the pandemic because we still have vectors out there in society. And we've done everything we can to be able to build an infrastructure that's ready to go. So a shout out to Dr. Dirksen, Dr. Rosales from our rural health office who are working diligently with all of our partners in Santa Cruz County, Graham, Greenlee, Yuma, to be able to help them and augment their resources. But bottom line is the number of vaccines. The state has been a great partner. The city has been a great partner. Dr. Chris, Governor Ducey have been fantastic in getting every, just about any of our requests they try and honor, but they're hampered because they can only act as fast as the federal government gives them the vaccines. So I just want the people to know it's on our radar screen. The president has directed us to work hard to reach out to these underserved populations and pe people of color, people that are socially disadvantaged, geographically disadvantaged. And as, soon, as we get more vaccines, we have proven we can double our output. And we have vans that are willing to go to those communities as well. And we started doing that already. But I think it's worth having a little conversation about that so the public realizes as happy and proud as we are as what we've accomplished, we are still feeling um, there's a lot more to do, especially with these vulnerable populations. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Rich, because we can't all feel safe until the entire world is vaccinated. Uh, we've got to start and do what we can in our own communities. Uh, but I'll reiterate, um, we work with our county and our state partners. They set the policy. Um, these vaccines are assigned to us, but they're not fungible. We can't move them and go administer them wherever we want. Now, we can work out with the state or the county, and we've done this in cooperation. I can remember uh, when we were starting to talk about um, serving the state pod function here uh, on the campus, that you advocated for additional doses that we could use in our mobile uh, public health uh, van uh, uh, situation, just like we're doing in Maricopa County. I mean, Dr. Rosales and the public health team in, um, in Phoenix are working hand in hand with the state and the county uh, to go out into the community to underserved populations to deliver vaccine. And we just have not had enough vaccine to do that. I've, I've talked to uh, uh, Mayor Romero about the possibility, could the state open up a new pod uh, you know, on the South side? Uh, and I know there've been discussions uh, with Raytheon who has a health clinic um, but the state and the county have to work together. We're, we're always willing to help. And I think, uh, Rich, the, the state had confidence that our team uh, could deliver. And we've, we've outperformed even what I think the state thought we could do because we've got so many people who are so mission driven, who come out and volunteer and serve the community and, and I, I just keep coming back to once we get the vaccine, you know, we were, we were thinking of trading vaccine with the county. That's not allowed. Um, I do think uh, one final point is we said if we were going to do this for the state, open the state pod up, we wanted it to be incremental doses. And having almost 50,000 doses in Pima County this week, uh, is more doses being delivered um, uh, to the to the residents of Southern Arizona? Because there were detractors that said, "Well, the the university is taking away from uh, from the county." Now we've got more doses going to the county, and they are going out into the community, into neighborhoods, into religious uh, institutions, uh, the place where people may not have a, the ability to, to, uh, to drive down to uh, the centers that have been open. And, and also, Rich, I think we were talking earlier about um, Dr. Dirksen, Dr. Rosales and public health going out into the communities to, to service the agricultural workers who oftentimes, I mean, they're working seven days a week. And if we can go out and educate bilingually and provide the vaccine. And I think that's why 
you know, the uh, the Johnson & Johnson is an attractive one because it doesn't have to be in minus 80 and it can go on the road and be distributed more uh, easily. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good reminder on the uh, on the farm workers because often they are geographically displaced. Often they have language barriers. These are people of color, often poor, living on the margins of society, yet they are very essential because that's our food chain. That's our food chain. If they don't get to do their work, we don't get food. It's just like the people in grocery stores that we didn't think about essential before, but you start to see how we are all inextricably tied together. Really, we're all essential in some form or another, you know, but it, this is brought to the attention of the public, how we are mutually dependent upon one another. And so it is very important for us. And, and we, you know, we feel that's a responsibility as well as a privilege to be able to reach out to these populations wherever they are. And we're working hard. We continue to ask the state for more vaccines so that we can scale up again. We've demonstrated through our ICS that we are scalable. At any time we can surge and take on more responsibility, lowest common denominator is the vaccine. Last thing I might mention, Bobby, is just a reminder to everybody, especially the K to 12 educators, we have appointments available for you. Go to your HR and sign up. We want to get you vaccinated because we want to get our kids back to school and we want you to feel safe in school. So please take advantage of that because we have a special section set aside for all of you educators to get you back on the job and open our schools. Yeah, so our, our initial assignment from the county was to vaccinate uh, daycare workers, preschool, K through 12, Pima Community College and U of A employees. Uh, and I think we're almost through that. We do have about a thousand K-12 uh, employees or, and teachers who've yet to be vaccinated. We're working with the superintendents. We're using this as a uh, way to, to get the word out. We've got appointments. Please come over and get vaccinated. I, okay, Holly. <clears throat> oh, hey, thanks. Excuse me. I would also uh, like to mention that, you know, I think the problems of not having appointments and not being able to get appointments has been rectified. You know, we opened up a severe amount of appointments this week, I think like 10,000, and we still have some available. So if people are wanting to get appointments, again, you go to azdhs.gov or podvaccine.azdhs.gov and register. It looks like, you know, even just for ours, we still have appointments in our sit-down clinic and our drive through starting on Thursday. And we'll open additional appointments once we figure out what our allotment is um, coming from the state this week. So, you know, I think it's been frustrating and people have gotten a little bit used to not being able to do the, you know, get through the appointment system. But I think that those kinks have been worked out now. So if you can't get an appointment, please make sure to check back every couple of days, every three days, because those appointments become available more and more now as we're getting more um, vaccines delivered to us from the, from the state and then through the, uh, through the county as well. Yeah, the, we're the only state pod that has the ambulatory uh, component, uh, and it's very impressive. Uh, the, the number of people that can come through the Giddings classroom and the, the, the staff is just doing a tremendous job of serving uh, the community. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that uh, if, you, if you're having, if you're getting frustrated with the computer system, as Holly said, it's much better uh, much easier, much more uh, logical. But there's that uh, 602-1000 number that we talked about. Just call. Somebody can walk you through it um, and help you. Or if you don't have access to a computer, can actually get you registered. That's right. And, and an also to note, it's also a bilingual um, hotline. So anybody um, can call Spanish or English uh, speaking folks to get those. And that number is 602-542-1000 just for Southern Arizona. So please, I mean, I, we talk about it every day in our meetings, but I, it's so important to us to make sure that we are getting to those people and, and addressing the need for people who haven't been able to get appointments in the past. The, the other thing I would say is um, we are trying to work with advocacy groups who are representing the most vulnerable populations to work with them, to help them uh, get the people they're advocating for 
vaccinated. And that's being done through public health, the city, the county, and the state. So um, that's another big important issue around um, not-for-profit advocacy groups advocating on behalf of their constituents. You ready for questions? Sure. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. Our first question, I'm assuming, is coming from Craig Smith at KGUN 9. Go ahead, Craig. Hi, uh, Dr. Robbins. Uh, Sorry to ask you something that, a little off your main topic here, but I'm obliged to ask you about the, the uh, U of A basketball notice of allegations from the NCAA. What has the university done so far in response to those? What will you do? And um, please comment on uh, the, the decisions that uh, you have to make and will make regarding uh, uh, the coach. Well, that's a lot there, Craig. We we released those uh, uh, that notice of allegations from the NCAA, um, and we we have uh, been we actually selected to go through the IERP, uh, and that process is ongoing. Um, and and so you know every time I try to predict when that process will end, uh, I've been off by a magnitude of years. So I'm not gonna get into predicting when that might be over. We're hoping uh, as soon as possible um, so that we can, can move forward. Um, you know, Coach Miller is our coach. Uh, we're working with him uh, about remaining our coach, obviously. Uh, and we're very eager to find out uh, of all of those uh, allegations We'll have our opportunity to address those, um, but it, the, we, we have not heard from the IERP. So the IERP is going through this process. They will be the final word. There's no, um, there's no appeal process with the IERP, but we will have a chance uh, to address the new uh, notice of allegations that will come from the IERP. I, I think we're the on, only the third university to go through this, and at least I'm not familiar with the other two, I think it's LSU and Kansas, that they've received any word back from the IERP, and they were ahead of us in this whole process. So it's an ongoing investigation. Uh, they have the ability to go back and and reinvestigate, uh, you know, this case. Um, you know, they could uh, they could have new findings, uh, and we just have to wait, Craig, and find out where what the final word is going to be. They could also very well uh, eliminate some of those allegations that had come forward as they look at and discuss some of the things that are in the current notice of allegations. They could be reduced. So we have to wait. I, I, I'm not sure um, uh, what the timing is going to be. We hope as soon as possible that uh, we can get uh, past this as a university. Coach Miller and his family and the uh, basketball program can move forward and look forward to, uh, you know, he's out there recruiting. I think signing day is coming up soon. We've got a really good team. They're young. But good. And we're eager to move forward and get the final chapter of this now almost four year saga over. But Coach Miller is our coach. Uh, I talked to him last week uh, and we want to move forward to uh, to continue to make progress and keep our team together. Uh, give him the ability to go out and recruit players and plan for next year. We're going to be playing basketball, uh, you know, in six months. It's hard to believe, but uh, it's, it, you know, it's a constant recruiting process. I mean, he's recruiting, you know, juniors in high school now. He's, he's starting to think about recruiting sophomores in high school. So it's, uh, it's a complex uh, process. And I, I mean, even if I uh, had any details to share with you, I can't talk about an ongoing investigation, but I just don't have any. Uh, we haven't heard from the IERP. I'm eagerly awaiting them uh, to tell us how they view what the NCAA has done uh, to this point and, and 
are they going to add more things to us or are they going to hopefully take away some things? And then once we hear from the IARP, which I unfortunately think is going to be weeks, if not months away, then we can move forward with responding to these uh, new allegations and finally find out what is the final verdict in this very long, very taxing complex and very sad chapter in the uh, history of the University of Arizona. I think, thank you. Uh, if I could, oh yeah, there you go, Craig, sorry. Thank you. Uh, if, if I could just move back on a COVID issue, uh, the, uh, I, I, I saw that you, you all are continuing the party patrol effectively and so on, but as the um, restrictions on gatherings loosen up, are you can are you gonna continue to uh, try to enforce sanctions against the uh, against the students? And also, please comment on how you're loosening up the attendance at uh, certain sporting events. Yeah, Rich, maybe you can comment on the cart thing for the sports. Um, uh, I think they're going to be uh, Craig. I think I'm right on this. I, I mean, maybe Holly and and Rich can can jump in and correct me, but I think there's going to be a limited number uh, I saw of people who will be able to attend uh, baseball games, softball games. Our teams are doing very well, so we would love for the fans to be able to go out and support our teams, but that will be on a limited basis because we still, even as we, as I said in the uh, opening remarks, even as we start to make some progress, we're still very, very vulnerable. Uh, And, you know, the next few weeks, I think trying to get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we can stop these variants for taking a foothold and being spread like wildfire because they, uh, the the mutants, the the virus, you know, it's a very simple virus, but it's pretty smart. And these mutants are uh, more infectious and potentially can make you sicker. So the good news is that uh, I think what I've seen is that the J&J vaccine may be a little more effective against some of the mutants. But the point is, get the first vaccine that is made available to you and let's move on uh, because we've got to be able to vaccinate as many people as fast as possible. But with regard to, it's a good question, uh, Rich, that Craig poses about um, if you're allowed to have up to 50 people, are we going to have people, uh, you know, uh, gathering? The, the problem I have with that, and I, I'm going to stop talking so you can answer, is y- you can have people gathered. Like, like, I don't know what the number of people that are going to be allowed to softball and baseball games, but we're going to ask them to cover their face, stay, stay distance, wash their hands, and in some of these, uh, quote, uh, Craig, parties, uh, they are allowed to, to gather maybe up to 50. Uh, I'm not sure we're quite ready for that. But you have to do it responsibly. Right. You have to stay distance and mask. And if you've been to any of these events, they're not doing any of that. Okay, Holly, maybe you, you had your hand up, but then go to Rich to finish so- it off. Uh, it looks like the number four that we're going to be allowing uh, or looking at to allow uh, in increments up to softball and baseball is 1600 oh. with the provision that you are socially distanced and masked at the entire games. And so I know athletics is working with Pima County on what that plan looks like, but that's, that's what we're hearing now. Yeah. I just add on, I think the president's been spot on in his remarks. Uh, there's a process in place where, as I said, President gets a briefing every 24 hours of, uh, regarding the specific metrics that we look to measure our progress. And in concert with our public health advisory team, which we meet with uh, weekly, but have discussions every day, uh, we will look and see how long the numbers that are telling us we're more stable stay down. And typically we look for a week or two that they're stable, that it's not just an aberrancy. And when we see that they stay down for long enough, then we say, all right, well, what can we open up? And what you've seen with our students, we've gone for a larger amount of students in the class. But that doesn't mean they're not adhering to masking and social distancing, as Holly has said. So we'll continue to move forward based on the best science, based on the great advice we get from our public health advisory team. 
And if we see that the numbers stop, if the numbers go back and show that we are starting to peak again, we stop and go back to a previous stage. And it's the same for graduation. It's the same for softball, for basketball, for football. We use the same metrics and we make smart decisions based on the epidemiologic data and assuming that as we give our students, faculty and community the privilege to come together, that they continue to adhere to the public health uh, best practices as the president has alluded to. It's also important to note that at those softball and baseball games, there's not gonna be any concessions open to limit the interactions amongst the crowds. So really they've taken athletics and, and our public health officials have really taken a hard look at how they are going to implement this plan and do it safely. You know, even looking at things like how often do you clean the restrooms? How often do you, you know, how long are you allowed to do these things just to make sure that anybody that's in attendance is, you know, as safe as they can possibly be. And, and I think it's a matter of just getting into habits, good public health hygiene habits. I mean, when you walk by one of those dispensers, just clean your hands. You know, keep your face covered, stay away from as many people as you possibly can. And I think the way they'll have those seats done is you'll be treated as like mini pods. You can have four seats. So those people are in your pod. You probably rode to the game together or whatever. You probably live together, at least interact. And so I, I think that um, that'll work out really well. It's outdoors. Um, th that mitigates uh, the uh, as well. So I, I'm in favor of this. I, I think it can be safely done. And I think people, uh, uh, officials at the games, will, if they see people that aren't uh, covering their face, they're going to come and say, you need to cover your face. If not, you need to leave the stadium. So the, it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but how exciting for our players, uh, you know, that their families can come, people who love to support our U of A teams will be able to come out. I, I think it's a, a move in the right direction if we can do it safely. Our next question comes from KOLD. Go ahead. Hey there, it's Megan McNeil. Um, I was just curious if y'all could paint a little bit more of a picture of what these commencement uh, ceremonies will look like. It's only for students, it'll be streamed online. I mean, where are they gonna be? How many students will be there? Um, if y'all could just paint a little bit more of a picture for you know parents and students who are watching at home of how this will actually go and what it will actually look like. Yeah, maybe Holly, you may be the one that can comment on this uh, best, but my understanding, what I've been advocating for is we want to have that Arizona Stadium experience. So I, I believe there will be like a thousand students on the field at a time spaced out. They will be able to walk and as they they won't actually get their diploma, but they will be able to walk in their their regalia, their caps and gowns, uh, and be recognized individually on the jumbotron with their picture. Um, and then once they're recognized, they don't walk back to their seat. They keep walking out of the stadium uh, and, and, and we'll do it sort of a thousand at a time. That's why I said in my opening remarks, I think it's May 11th through 18th, because we will have uh, multiple sessions every day. Um, uh, also, we're going to have smaller uh, college and affinity group uh, ceremonies to be able to honor those students. And again, do it in person. So those will be at multiple venues. Either the Jeannie and Cole Davis outdoor facility will be used, maybe uh, uh, some tents on the mall. I, I don't know all the details of that. But the beauty is we'll be in Arizona Stadium and be able to have the Jumbotron. I don't think we're going to be doing fireworks. Uh, and at this point, you know, Dr. Cullen and Dr. Garcia uh, have been incredibly uh, uh, gracious in helping us to plan these. Our um, public health advisory team has been part of these uh, discussions with Heather and, and her team who've done a tremendous job. Uh, I, you know, sort of uh, 
east of Texas, most of the universities that are doing this in person have allowed four family members. Sort of west of Texas is about two family members. So I would love to be able to offer the ability uh, based on how it goes with softball and baseball um, and based on the numbers. Again, if we can get back to a flat part of the curve and we think we could do it safely, and we'll do this in consultation and cooperation and collaboration with, uh, with the county health uh, officials, but could we have two or four family members that could come in the stadium and be spaced? We can't do that now because uh, we're just not to that point. But the good news is we're excited to announce that there will be in-person recognition of the class of 2021. They'll be able to have smaller uh, things with their college, but the big part will be in Arizona Stadium. And, and uh, Megan, I, I don't know all the details, but I can, I'm sure that Heather is going to have something that she can get out. There'll be a video that's sort of an animation of here's how it'll all flow. Uh, but we're just excited to announce it today. Yep, those uh, those negotiations and the the policy for that is ongoing right now. So, Megan, when we have updates, it'll be on our commencement website. Um, and if you want some background on that, you can call me directly, and I'm happy to walk you through what I know right now. Awesome. Can I have a quick follow up about the 2020 uh, commencement? Uh, I think you had mentioned that there might be some kind of celebration or commencement for those who graduated in 2020. What is that going to look like, and and what is that? Um, going to entail. Holly, you may know more than I do about this. I, you know, is it possible we could send out the word that, you know, could we d dedicate one ceremony to the 2020 class and invite them to come back? Mm -hmm. I, I think there would be some people who would come back, but I'm, I'm definitely uh, uh, over my skis on this. I don't know exactly what they're thinking, but something special for the class of 2020 for sure. There is definitely a lot of uh, conversations going on. They, uh, Heather Lukash's team sent out a survey to those who graduated in 2020. And based on those responses, they're looking at how they are gonna honor them. I don't believe we're gonna have any ceremonies this year, but they are looking at what they can do to incorporate a big celebration for those that missed out on 2020. Um, and those will, all of those details will also be posted. You know, It's just a matter of looking at how they make the, the arrangements and the logistics for that. So those, that information will be forthcoming too. Our next question comes from Stephanie Casanova from the Arizona Daily Star. Go ahead, Stephanie. Hi, um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, you guys keep saying when we have enough vaccines, we can you know, get permission from the state to get out into rural communities. How much is enough vaccines? Has the state told you, you know, once you get this many or once you get past X phase, um, you'll be able to use your mobile clinics to get away from the U of A's pod and, and go out to communities? Yeah, Dr. Carmona, I'll let you do that. Now, just to be clear about it, there's vaccine going out to the rural communities. Right. Oh, already? Right yeah. now, for yeah. sure. Yes, yeah, in, uh, we're working with Pima County, uh, who has a mobile uh, van, and uh, we're augmenting them. Uh, we also, uh, based on our discussions previously, looked at the broader area of the whole state where we have a footprint. And as we heard, Dr. Rosales and her team are up in Maricopa County assisting them. And we are looking at other counties in Southern Arizona, which have a paucity of resources to be able to do the same thing, commensurate with the amount of vaccines we can get from the state. And we've had those discussions with the state already. They are very supportive of this. They want us to do it, but they're also struggling to get more vaccines from the federal government who controls the flow. So, but the good news is we've already started doing that in certain areas, as I've said, but there's a lot more to do so we can help some of the rural counties who don't have the resources to be able to surge and uh, be able to, you know, get a, get the populations done a lot quicker. <clears throat> but health departments in every county have been getting all along their allocation based on population. Right. We we would just go to them and help them. Uh, as Rich said, they may have a limited team and maybe only one site at the health department you have to go down to. 
What we think we can help with is being uh, an amplifier to go out and deliver into the community with our mobile vans through our incredible public health college. Right. Did you have a follow-up, Stephanie? All right, well, we'll move on. Our next question comes from Rocio um, from KJAZ. Go ahead, Rocio. Hey, good morning. Um, I wanted to just have you reiterate, you know, why is this now the right time to hold those in-person commencement ceremonies and how, why are you encouraged to plan for most in-person classes for next semester? Yeah, I think I think it's the right time because we're we're seeing that transmission. Uh, I mean, for at least the last month, uh, the number of cases on campus has been well under one percent. So um, we think that these are outdoor activities in, with regard to commencement, and we think we can plan. Uh, I think we've proven. Uh, throughout this pandemic, we uh, have the capability to plan and to uh, keep safety first and foremost uh, in, uh, for our faculty, staff, and students. And we believe that uh, by the fall, um, there will be uh, continued flattening of the curve, uh, low incidence and prevalence of the, of the um, virus in our community. Uh, moreover, we think that uh, the majority of our faculty, staff, and students will have been vaccinated. So we think it'll be safe to move forward with uh, classes in the fall. I think we lost Dr. Carmona. Hopefully he can join back in. Um, so we'll go to Christina Duran from Tucson Local Media. Go ahead, Christina. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, so my question is kind of a follow up to that. Uh, so would that be in the fall, the expectation to move to stage three? Or would that come before that? Um, you know, I think, Christina, we're we're considering, do we move to stage three uh, later in the spring? Um, and we, we look at this every week and kind of look give a two week look out to where we think we would be. Um, no, I, I think what we're talking about is moving to stage four uh, in, in the fall uh, term. Um, now, we'll have to work through all of those things, but uh, those are that will all be decided based on the public health um, parameters that, that we go over with our uh, public health advisory team uh, on a weekly basis. But, you know, if... If the, if the number of cases is down and uh, we have everyone who wants and needs a vaccine uh, at the university vaccinated, meaning all faculty, staff, and students, then uh, we think that, that it would be safe to return to, um, as I said, most classes being offered in person if individuals want that. If they choose they don't want to do it, they can, they can go to remote uh, um, modalities if they don't feel safe or, you know, let's just say that someone for whatever reason can't get the vaccine uh, because of uh, allergies to the, the vaccine or they just don't think that it's safe to get the vaccine and they don't want to come back to school they can continue to, uh, to learn online. Um, so I, I, th I think that for those individuals who want the vaccine, it's gonna be uh, made available to them. And we think that that will be done by the fall. So I think we have a few follow-ups and one additional question. The first follow-up comes from Craig Smith um, at KGUN9. Go ahead, Craig. Hi, I'm just trying to clarify uh, my question regarding the uh, party enforcement uh, and whether even if, uh, say, the state uh, uh, lifts uh, gathering restrictions even farther than they already have or based on what they have already lifted, if 
you all are going to decide perhaps that for the university community, it's still better to, to limit these parties and that you may attempt to still, or you may plan to still sanction students who participate in large parties like this. I'm not, I wasn't talking about the sports gatherings. Yeah, yeah. No, I saw that. I think I saw it pop up in the chat, Craig. Uh, and I hope someone had answered. Um, yeah, I think that uh, certainly on campus, uh, we, we always have had a better uh, ability to control the environment. Um, off campus, it becomes more challenging. But I, I think the rules of engagement are if the CART team determines that there are citations, um, then those people that are uh, cited will be referred to the disciplinary process uh, with the Dean of Students. Um, my, my understanding is that's been a pretty small number, even over the course of the, of the whole year, um, but there have been some individuals who have multiple uh, infractions uh, who have even uh, been expelled from the university and some have had some disciplinary actions. But I think it's a pretty rare occurrence. And you're right, Craig, as the, as the, uh, as the state and the county and the city uh, expand the ability to congregate, uh, you know, let's say 50 or 100, then, then the CART team, uh, you know, through these rules of engagement, wouldn't end up citing people. They'll only cite them if they're breaking the rules and if the rules change, they won't be citing them. Um, so we're getting really close to time. I think we can take one more question and I know there's a lot of follow-ups in the chat. So um, for Craig and Megan and Stephanie and Christine, if you wanna just send me those follow-up questions, I'll answer them directly. But our last question will come from uh, Griselda. Zatino from KTAR News. Go ahead, Griselda. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. So my question is for Dr. Carmona. Uh, the CDC has released new guidance uh, for uh, people that have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, one of the guidance is that you can now gather indoors with a small group of people with other fully vaccinated people and you don't have to wear a mask and you can also do the same with others who aren't vaccine vaccinated as long as they or someone they live with is not high risk for the virus. Dr. Yeah. Carmona, what are your thoughts about this? I think we've lost Dr. Carmona, but I saw that uh, flash on my phone right before we started the briefing. And uh, Holly and I had the, uh, the chance to talk to Rich about that. Um, I, I, think, I think that's where we're headed. Um, you know, in a very, if you read, at least I just quickly read the, uh, the article uh, from the CDC uh, or the comments from the CDC. I haven't read the full report. But I think it makes sense, um, and that's where, that's why I'm more confident that by the fall uh, we'll be able to have uh, in-person classes. Uh, my hope is that we'll be able to have people at our sporting events. Um, we're already uh, the Pac-12 has already had this discussion that allows. That's why we're opening it up, and we had this discussion earlier about allowing people to softball and and uh, baseball and other spring sports because it's based on the local uh, health uh, advisory. So um, I think it really helps for the CDC. I mean, the CDC basically has been missing in action for the most part for the last uh, you know, year because of uh, you know, political issues. But now that they're free to do their job, they're one of the premier public health uh, and scientific uh, institutions in the world. And so I think we should all read this, digest it and do what it says. I mean, I think it's the best guidance that we have. Um, and it makes sense to me. If everybody's fully vaccinated, um, you don't need to, to, to have in, in, in your indoors and, and you're with others that have been fully vaccinated, then you probably don't need to wear uh, a mask. If, um, if you have people that are living with you and they're low risk. Now, if they're high risk, you need to still treat them uh, by staying as far away from them as possible 
and hopefully trying to help them get vaccinated if they can from a medical standpoint. So I, I think we'll we'll have more to uh, say about this as we read it, but it makes perfect sense to me. And they are the expert authority, and I'm glad to see that they're out uh, making uh, pronouncements. All right, that's all the time we have. Any closing remarks, President Robbins? No, I mean, it's a sign of the times. Uh, I don't have my mask with me, but I got mine. Continue to uh, to be vigilant and uh, bear down and mask up, and and we'll have more exciting things to share with you next week.